we work today as well. Okay, any questions we can begin on your current assignment? Yeah? For, for this lecture, I, again, my apologies, I'm running against deadlines. This week has been another one. <laughs> so I just finished it this morning <laughs> and I put it up uh, just about 15 minutes ago. So, uh, but again, like in last lecture, it's going to be quite a bit of demonstration. But there is a little bit of uh, theory that uh, we will cover. So uh, I will try to catch up and put it at least the night before <laughs> from next week on. So in the last lecture, we looked at HISIS, an introduction to HISIS, which is a process simulator. The main thing that you need to know and from this course point of view is that it's essentially a steady state lumped parameter type of models for various unit operations or process equipment, heat exchangers, pumps, reactors, uh, flash drum, uh, multi-component distillation, absorption, extraction. All these you will see in other courses. But to use HISIS, it's going to be as easy as we saw in the last lecture when it works because it's fairly easy to pull all those icons and connect them up and it guides you through. But you must have a chemical engineering understanding. You must have an understanding of the numerical methods. Because one thing that we did get stuck is this adjust block where it was doing in an iterative fashion. And we just aborted it because we didn't know how many iterations we were going to take. And I didn't have the time to figure out where to set the increase the number of iterations. But it was approaching already towards that final uh, adjust point. So I will put another assignment where you get to play with these adjust block ideas, which is essentially the underlying idea is that you are transferring the degree of freedom from one variable to another variable. And you are implementing it in a method, something similar to bisection method, where you are bracketing the target uh, gradually to the desired value. So it's, it's an iterative process. So the concepts that you are learning in this course about iteration, about convergence, about tolerance, errors, and stuff like that will be useful in interpreting when HISIS doesn't work, okay, and in knowing how to make it work. Um, but we are not going to see all the unit operations and the models behind them because it's basically an introductory course. You will see those in the other courses in greater detail. And so uh, that, that's essentially algebraic equations. Now, there is a part of HISIS that does dynamic model, lumped dynamic model, which is a set of ordinary differential equations. You know how to solve ordinary differential equations, but you don't know the theory behind it. So that's where we are heading towards. Okay, so we want to look at the underlying ideas or algorithms that MATLAB or HISIS or any computer simulation package would use in order to uh, formulate and solve these problems. So the last lecture, we looked at, um, started the next topic, which is a functional approximation. Um, why do we need functional approximation? And how do we go about it? Uh, are the issues that we are going to talk about in the next few lectures? And how does MATLAB implement it? Okay, so there are two types of problems we said. One is, given a function that looks very messy, complicated, I want to construct an approximate representation of the function so that I can use the approximation to calculate. But these days, it may not be a problem because no matter how complicated the function is, you can always write a function file, and MATLAB has a lot of them pre-built, and you can just evaluate them. Even calculators will have many of these functions in the future uh, built in. Uh, the more important set of uh, problem that we solve in the functional approximation is the second set. The second set which says, given a set of data points, how do I represent that by a function? Okay. Uh, wh why is that important? Because as chemical engineers, you will see that we collect data from the plant or when you're doing unit ops lab in, the, in your own undergraduate curriculum, you will see that you're collecting data from experiments. Okay. You're collecting data on concentration versus time, temperature versus pressure. There are many kinds of data that we collect. And we want to analyze the data. And we want to be able to predict based on that data set, how the performance might change. So there are two types of models. The type of models that we have seen so far are called first principles models. So we use conservation laws, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, etc. The second set of laws are laws that are data driven. 
So the, the underlying process is so complicated that we cannot really write a model, but we have data on the performance. So using that data, can we build model? Can we represent them in functional form? Then use that for analysis, for prediction, for optimization purposes like that. So that is the more important of the two problems. Okay, given a set of data, how do you represent it by a function? They are very related. That's why we are going to the theory underlying that are very uh, similar to each other. So we are going to look at the theory. Okay, so we started looking at this error function in the last class. What is error function? Error function is given by this integral that you see on the right hand side. Uh, there is probably already an error. See, I am not paying attention to these things. This should have been a 2 over pi, I think, because I'm preparing these notes in a hurry. Uh, but they are in the text that I have uploaded onto Moodle. Okay? I'm just taking the material from there in Chapter 4 right now. So this is error function is an integral that appears naturally in solving certain differential equations. Okay? And uh, there are a number of other functions that you might come across. If you have done a differential equations course, you will... Uh, of course, no sines and cosines as Fourier series as solutions to certain differential equations or Bessel functions, Legendre functions. What applied mathematicians do is if you give them a set of differential equations, they will solve it by a series expansion method. So these are all infinite series and then they will give them a label, a tag. This series is called, I'm going to call it as error function. This series I'm going to call it as Bessel function. So when I see a template of a differential equation, I know, okay, the solution to this is Bessel function. And MATLAB has all these built in. So I can actually construct the solution. I can look at the temperature profile in a fin. For example, the fin problem that we studied at the very beginning, uh, if you look at the transient solution to the fin problem, it will be in terms of sines and cosines. Cartesian fin. If you look at the cylindrical fin, then the solutions will be in terms of Bessel functions, for example. So the concepts are the really same, just a variation in ideas and the labeling of these functions by different names. So for our purposes, error function is this integral, and this integral cannot be evaluated analytically. Okay, so what do I do? In the last class, I think we started uh, uh, exploring this in MATLAB, and then in something called MuPad. So I'm going to introduce MuPad to you today. Okay, so I, I think if I remember right, we actually created the error function plot. So if you say error function 0 0.5, it knows about error function. So it evaluates that integral for us at that 0.5 value. And what you need to re realize is that x is the unknown here. And x does not appear on the right-hand side. x appears not in the function, but only as a limit. Okay. So the function itself is represented by a different variable psi. The graphical or the physical meaning of that we saw in the last class. That would simply mean that I'm going to plot e to the power minus psi square against psi. It will be like this. And I choose an x as the upper limit. And I find the area under that curve. Integral is nothing but area under a curve. So in this case, the curve is e to the power minus psi square. You plot that curve and compute the area under the curve. MATLAB has other tools also for computing integrals for computing derivatives, etc. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go to MuPad. And some of you are familiar with Mathematica. Mathematica is exactly the same thing functionally as MuPad is. Okay. But MuPad is a toolbox within MATLAB. And one of the important things that you should know between the difference between MATLAB and Mathematica or MATLAB and MuPad. Okay. MuPad is a sub toolbox in Mat Mat MATLAB, but MATLAB deals with numerical operations. MATLAB is a matrix laboratory, so it deals only with numbers, whereas MUPAD deals with symbols. So what is the difference between those? We'll try to learn that today. Okay. So when you type MUPAD in MATLAB, you will have a new MUPAD window opening up. I hope it will work because I need the license for these. Uh, so this is a subsystem. MATLAB has several subsystems like this. There's another one called Simulink, which is like HiSys. It has a gra graphical user interface where you can pull these icons and connect them up. And you'll see more about it in a control course, hopefully. Okay? But MuPad has on the right hand side a number of operators like the derivative, the integral, infinite series, 
these are all symbolic operators. Okay. So suppose I say uh, I want to calculate the derivative of the sine function, okay, um, or the integral of the sine function. So there is a function called int sine of x with respect to x. Okay. So it's very much like MATLAB in terms of the functions. What you see is i and t is a function name, and within that sine x is a parameter, an argument. X is an argument. So there are two arguments that this function int will take, and when I hit return, if it works well, it should give me the integral of sine of x. It's taking a long time. It should not take this long. <laughs> Minus cos of x. Okay. So it is a symbolic expression. So cos again is a symbolic expression. Okay. So if you go and uh, type uh, in MATLAB, MATLAB window int of sine of x with respect to x, what do you think it will do? It should give you an error. Okay. Because what it needs is a, a range, it will deal with numbers, so you need to identify the range over which you want to integrate. So that means you are evaluating a definite integral. Then there is a function in MATLAB called quad that will evaluate the same integral but numerically and will return a numerical value for that sine function over a certain limit. Whereas in NewPad you get an analytical result. Okay? So suppose I say integral of sine of x squared with respect to x. Now sine of x you may remember as minus cos of x. If I say sine squared x, I don't remember that. And uh, but my, so, uh, mu pad or Mathematica, if you try the same thing in Mathematica, will return the integral. Okay. Now, if I say uh, integral oops, in of sine of x squared, I'm just drawing more and more complicated expressions to it to see when it will fail. Okay. And when it fails, what does it do? Even mu pad, it's same thing will happen with Mathematica cannot integrate that expression, sine square x square. Okay? Now, the, the sine x square multiplied by sine x square, that's what we are implying by that. So when it hits that roadblock, it just returns an expression in the form of an integral of sine square, but it doesn't have a closed form integration of that, it's not able to do that. Okay? Now, if I uh, type uh, that particular expression that I want, which is integral of exp of minus uh, psi square uh, it will uh, good question it will mu pad has a subsystem of numerical calculation so it will well there are two two questions in the in that embedded one is when you say definite integral with this finite numbers the result will be a number so then it will automatically switch into numerical in evaluation of that that is, it evaluates the integral sine of x and then uh, puts a limit and gives you the final result. Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. We can try it. Okay, but let me try to illustrate what I'm trying to finish. What I'm trying to start here. What am I trying to do here in this line? E to the power minus psi squared d psi. Okay, that is the integral I wanted for error function. If you re recall in the notes. I think my computer is loading up with too many windows. Um, this is the integ integral e to the minus i squared d psi. That is the integral I want. Okay. So I'm trying to evaluate that. And what did it give me? It recognized that integral as containing, uh, as having the name error function. So that is the error function of psi with 2 over square root of pi. Because in the definition of error function, if you recall, I had 2 over square root of pi. I, I forgot to put that. For example, if I go back to that line and multiply it by uh, square root of pi divided by 2 multiplied by that. Okay. What did I do? I want it the other way. Thank you. 2 divided by 
square root of pi multiplied by that. So that it recognizes that as an error function. Okay. So your question was, will it accept uh, definite integrals? Um, there is, if you go and pull that down here, there is a form for definite integrals. Okay. So when you select that icon, if you didn't know, for example, this is a nice thing. I wish MATLAB had this feature. What what you have is on the right hand side. These are icons or symbols I can recognize. So it's an integral. Then I pull it down. It says these are the various forms, and then I select that. It creates a line for me, putting that function name, and then placeholder response. Okay. So if I come and put it in here, uh, what did I want? Sine of x square square. That's what you wanted to find out, right? And then the variable is x. And the limits, so what do you want between 0 and uh, 5? Let's see what it does. I don't know the answer what it's going to do, but you should have this curiosity and try, try it on, uh, by yourself. Whenever you have such a question, just try it and you see how it responds. Pair is very slow. <laughs> what did it do? It just put the limits there between 0 and 5. Okay. Um, so the question is can I get a numerical answer out of it? And probably you can. Uh, well, definitely you can. There is a numerical component to mu pad. But let's not waste time trying to figure this out. I will try to figure this out if you are still curious, but you also do the same thing. Okay. So what, what we want to learn is the basic difference between symbolic processing, which is MuPad interface in MATLAB, underlying that there is a toolbox, and then numerical processing, which MATLAB does. Okay. So error function from our point of view then is an infinite series expansion that has uh, a particular name. It is a particular function. Now, how can I evaluate that? How does MATLAB evaluate that? If I put error function of 0.5, it gives me a number. How does it do that? There are a number of ways of doing it. And one way is to recognize that it is an infinite series. So I can, for example, take this expression for e to the power minus psi square. You know that e to the power x has an infinite series. What is e to the power x? 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial, etc. It just goes on. It's an infinite series. A particular type of infinite series that we have chosen to give the name e to the power x. So I can take this and substitute in there okay, for e to the power minus psi squared. Then every term is integrable because all I have is integral of 1, integral of x, integral of x square, etc. I can integrate term by term and I can get a series expansion for that particular uh, error function. So the error function is also an infinite series, <coughs> a series expansion. And I thought I had it somewhere. There it is. Okay. So this is e to the power minus psi square, just a series expansion, infinite series. Okay. And uh, because I have psi squared, this becomes x to the power 2k, okay? Because e to the power x is 1 plus x plus x squared, but I have e to the power x squared, okay? So I get a 2k there. And then when I do the integration of that term by term, um, I will get um, the error function. Of course, 2 over square root of pi is defined in the error function as part of its definition. Why? Just to make the error function go between 0 and 1. Okay. So if you evaluate the integral between 0 to infinity of just the integral of this, it will give you square root of pi over 2, as we saw in Maple. Okay. So integral of x to the power 2k is what? x to the power 2k plus 1. That's what I get here. Divided by 2k plus 1. So term by term, I do the integration because these are uh, just power functions. And then I have an expression for uh, the error function itself. So if I put in the value for 0.5, I just need to plug in 0.5 here and take the infinite series and add them up. So I'll get the error function. That's in fact exactly how 
MATLAB will do it. Now we're going to introduce a very important concept here. Because it's an infinite series, I think we already talked about it when we did the my exp, the exponential function. This is true for all infinite series because we have to truncate it. So the concept is even though the summation goes all the way to infinity, uh, in real life I cannot take infinite terms. It's going to be computing all the time. I don't need because I need only a finite precision, okay? Maybe seven digits or 14 digits. So I can truncate the series with a finite number of terms n. That's an important concept, okay? So I'm approximating, if you notice here, I'm approximating that function, error function, by a polynomial of a certain degree. So the subscript there refers to the degree of the polynomial, to n plus one. Okay, it's still a function of x, and so I have truncated it up to n. So if I take n terms, because I have to substitute n here, I will get 2n plus 1. That is why I get the degree of the polynomial. The highest term after I truncate, this process is called truncation, meaning I'm going to ignore the higher order terms. And those are called the residuals, residuals in the infinite series expansion. They will become smaller and smaller. Why would they become smaller and smaller? There is a factorial k in the denominator which goes to 0, 1 over k factorial goes to 0 much faster than the x. Okay? If you understand that, then you will understand the table that I have shown you below to illustrate the problem in evaluating this. Okay? So what is this table? This table simply says, if I take two terms and I want to calculate an approximation to the error function with only the first two terms. Okay? And I want to do that at x equal to 0.5. Then I want to do that with x equal to 1. Then I want to do that with x equal to 2. Okay? Intuitively, what would you expect in terms of how many terms do you need to achieve a desired accuracy? How many of you understand what the question means? Okay? Pardon me? You, you need more as x gets greater. Those guys understand the idea of convergence of a series. All of you must have seen it, but I want to make sure that everybody understands the rate of convergence of a series and this idea of the error term. How big is the error? To reduce the error, when you specify tolerance, for example, in many of these routines, what you are specifying is telling MATLAB, control this error. Okay, this error should be below 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 14. Now, if you say I want it less than 10 to the minus 20, MATLAB will now be able to do that because MATLAB can carry only 14 significant digits, right? So the tolerance should be within the range that MATLAB can handle and that is an information that goes in deciding how many terms that you need in order to calculate that, okay? I've left one blank. I just want to make sure that everybody is able to calculate that. So uh, take a minute, calculate that number, and tell me what it is. That will tell me whether you understand. Do, do you need any explanation of how I constructed the table? All of you understand what it, how it is done? If not, you have to put up your hand, and I will explain. Uh, you, you probably don't even need a calculator, just two terms, right? n equal to 2, x equal to 1, I make life really easy for you. <laughs> n is 2, that means you will have to have 3 terms, k is equal to 0, 1 and 2. Uh, yeah, that is an approximate error function. Yeah. So, so you do need a calculator. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So under the.
So any questions? Did you all? Oh, you need to see the series, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, because I have so the question is how did I get the minus 1 to the power k in that expression how did I get that one minus 1 in the because I mean the, the question um, about how did I get this minus 1 to the power k in the series expansion. Remember e to the power x, the definition of that infinite series is 1 plus x plus x well, square well, over 2. Well, well, if x is well, negative, well, it will keep on alternating and that will give the right sign. So this is, in writing this infinite series in a compact form, you are allowing for x to be both positive and negative. Okay, so when you expand it in series, did the guys figure it out? So what, what you should have is error function to the power 1, I mean uh, at 1 should be 2 over square root of 5 multiplied by <coughs> minus 1 to the power 0, which is 1, and uh, x to the power 1 because k is equal to 0 the first term. You put k equal to 0 everywhere. Okay? So you will get um, basically 1 because x to the power 1 divided by 1, one fa 0 factorial which is 1. And then the second term and k equal to 1 will have a negative sign because minus 1 to the power 1. Okay? And then you will have 1 to the power 3, of course that's 1, divided by 3 multiplied by 1 factorial which is 1 okay plus the next term because n is 2 so you need to do uh, 3 terms when n is equal to 2 you will get a positive because minus 1 square it will become positive and the numerator is still 1 to the power 5 divided by 5 multiplied by 2 factorial which is 2 Okay, that, that is how you would expand it to fill this particular number and then you take it into the calculator and plug it in. Okay? So every number in the table is figured out by that, in taking increasing number of terms in the series. And what you will notice is when x is 0.5 or less than 1, because you have powers of x, it will converge very rapidly. x is decreasing but k factorial is also, 1 over k factorial is also decreasing. So four terms, it gives you four digits accuracy. But if you compare 15th digit, they may be different. But after four digits, if that is a tolerance you need, then four digits are accurate at 0.5. But at one, you, you need up to eight significant eight terms in the series before you can get the same result. Okay? But when you go for x equal to two, that is now you have 2 to the power 5, 2 to the power 7, etc. So that is a growing term. But factorial k grows much faster and it is in the denominator. Okay? And that's what kills the residuals down to 0. Eventually it will converge, but you need up to 20 terms before you can compare with exact. Now I say exact. What does exact mean here? The exact answer is an infinite decision, infinite decimal precision. Okay, so I'm truncating it to about 14 significant digits, the exact result that MATLAB can give me, which means up to 14 significant digits. Okay, <clears throat> so the concept of a truncation of a series, which gives rise to an error, which is often called the truncation error. And the truncation error is R. In a known series like this, you can actually calculate the next term, so you can calculate the error. But when you're dealing with unknown functions, the truncation error is often not known. We will see later on. Okay, so we will know the functional form. How does it change as it change 
the grid spacing, etc. Any questions on that? The idea of a truncation error and how to control it by simply taking more terms in the series in here. Um, I took it up to 50, and I, this one exact is done up to 15 significant digits. So, so as you go to the uh, 15 How do I do that, you mean? No, I mean, no, you should get n way too much, right? If you compare the uh, 15 digits. Right, right, that, right, yeah. So, that's, that's a good point. If if my tolerance is not 10 to the minus 4 in this particular table, what I'm saying is I'm looking for only four for five significant digits accuracy. So the moment it agrees with five significant digits, I can truncate. Okay, so in that respect, I need only six terms to get this accuracy. Okay. Oh sorry, eight terms to get this accuracy. But if my accuracy is 10 to the minus 10, then I will need more terms. That's what you're asking. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we can define an error and we need, we need to understand how the error changes as a function of x and as a function of n and we saw that in this table. Okay? So that error is the difference between the exact value of the error function at that particular value of x and its approximation, the polynomial approximation, the truncated series. So x appears here and n appears here. So n is a decision that you make. I want three terms, I want five terms. So depending on that, the error will change. Okay? And you should understand how to control that error. So once you once you take the degree of precision, like once you go from 10 to the power of minus 5 to minus 10 or something like that, then once you get the two numbers equal, anything after that goes after that. Will be all the they will all be smaller than 10 to the minus 10. So if your tolerance is 10 to the minus 10, you figure out in a MATLAB function how many terms you need. Okay? And then any other term will all be less than 10 to the minus 10. They will be adding. Those, those are the truncation that is the truncation error. That is the truncation error. Yeah. Okay? So that is one way of constructing an approximation if the function is known and it is complicated but you want the simple polynomial representation. Okay? But the, uh, another way is to not use, one. Uh, here we are using this idea of a basis function. So I'm going to introduce what is a basis function. Have you seen that before in uh, linear algebra? The basis vectors, yeah. right? So it's the same idea of what, a, what what is a basis vector. Let me ask you to make sure that we understand. A basis vector is a reference vector using which you can represent any other arbitrary vector. Okay? The simplest example of a basis uh, coordinate system or a basis vector would be north, south, east, west. So if you want to give somebody a coordinate location, we can give in the north direction, you go certain longitude or certain latitude. By giving those two numbers longitude and latitude, we can precisely locate where the point is. Right? So in the same sense, if I have a Cartesian frame, x1, x2, if I want to give somebody the coordinate locations of P, I can do that by giving that person these two numbers, x1 and x2. Simply means go in the x1 direction a certain distance and then go in the x2 direction in a certain distance. If you want to represent that in a vector form in algebra, what you would do is, you would represent that position vector P as i1 times x1 plus i2 times x2, which you would have seen before. Okay? So p is a vector, i1 and i2 are called the basis vectors. What is i1? i1 is a unit vector in the x1 direction, meaning it has a measure of 1, it has a length of 1. Similarly, i2 has a unit vector in the x2 direction. So if you want its components, what would i1 be? i1 be simply 1 and 0, means it is pointing in the x1 direction, it has no contribution in the x2 direction, the second element. So it is 1, 0. Similarly, i2 will be 0 and 1. If I have this basis vector, then I can represent p, position vector. How do I do that? Just like I did here. Take i1 multiplied by x1. x1 is the distance you have to travel in the x1 direction. And x2 is the distance you have to travel in the x2 direction. So this we call the arbitrary vector. So any arbitrary vector in space could be represented 
as a linear combination of the basis vectors I1 and I2. We are extending that idea to a function. Okay? So we define something called basis functions. This is a, it's like a unit vector. I know this function. Okay? So I can take these basis functions and add them up. Okay? And so the AI here is very similar to the X1 and X2. Okay? So it's basically saying if I want to construct an arbitrary function, how can I construct such an arbitrary function as a linear combination of these basis functions? A, a, a good example, how many of you are musicians here? Any musician? Anybody play any instrument? Good. Um, we, uh, you don't need to play an instrument to answer this question, okay? Because we can all listen to music, right? I'm condemned to only listen to music. I cannot play any instrument. But when I listen to a violin, I can tell it is violin that is playing. When I listen to a flute, I can tell that it is only the flute that is playing, right? There is a mathematical argument behind it. That's what I'm trying to get at, okay? So, uh, there are two people, one playing the violin, the other one playing the flute. And they both play the same note C. Okay? So C has a basic fundamental frequency, right? Maybe 440 hertz or whatever. Okay? How can I tell that this, uh, this sound is coming from a violin, the other sound is coming from uh, a flute because they are both producing the same frequencies? The waveform. The waveform. The musician it must be a uh, do you play with synthesizers? <laughs> okay. So the synthesizers, put a, a same keyboard can produce the music of a sound of a violin or a sound of a piano or a sound of a flute. And what is happening mathematically? How are synthesizers made? These are digital instruments, right? They deal with numbers. Digital instruments only know numbers. How can they produce that? That idea is very similar to that idea that I've given you here in terms of basis vectors, using basis functions. So he mentioned the word, word waveform. What is a waveform? So if I sample with a mic the sound from a violin and plot this amplitude okay, over a period of time, how will it look like? Okay, So it may look something like this, some strange shape. But the basic frequency would be 440 hertz if it is note C. Okay? If I sample the same thing from a flute, that may look somewhat different. But it will still have the same fundamental frequency. Okay? So in order to produce digital instruments or, or in order to produce a synthesized voice or a synthesized sound, what I need to do is do a Fourier series. Have you all seen Fourier series? Yes. No? <laughs> no, it's not, conceptually it is not very difficult. Okay? Fourier series is not very difficult to understand. What is Fourier series? Remember, what is the topic of our discussion today? Functional approximation, right? So here I have a very complicated waveform. How can I construct that complicated waveform in terms of simpler waveforms? What is the simplest waveform I know? That is periodic. Sines and cosines. Okay? So you can express this complicated uh, f of x that is periodic in terms of a series, something like this, a i sine omega i t. This axis is t, for example. So I have a sample waveform, which looks complicated. And then I, I'm saying in Fourier analysis, I'm saying I can represent that complicated waveform in terms of a summation uh, over i, many, many terms. Now, what are these sine omega i t? Those are simple, pure sine functions, right? So if I superpose for the flute, for example, I'm saying I'm going to take a pure sine wave, which has the same frequency. Now, this is another interesting experiment. I think even MATLAB may have this. You can generate pure sine wave and feed it to the speaker and try to hear what sound it produces at 440 hertz, okay? you will get a very boring monotonic sound, something like that, right? So, in order to produce, make that sound, the sound of a violin or a, a flute, what you have to do is recognize that you need to reproduce this complex waveform. And in Fourier analysis, what we do is, we say, okay, I can take a next frequency, for example, which is the double. That is, will be the next term in the series. 
So I'm going to construct a series. The first term is the dominant frequency. The next term is its higher harmonics, twice the frequency, three times the frequency, four times the frequency. Okay. So I construct a series. And then I say I need to weight them. I cannot add all of them together. I need to multiply each one of the fine term with a corresponding weight. It is that weight I need to find out. Okay? In such a way that when I add all these frequencies, I get this particular waveform. Am I making sense or not? Now, that information about fluid versus wiring, where does it go when I do this exercise? So the information is very distinct for the coefficient will be very different for each one of the instruments. And if I can get the coefficient, I can program. That's how digital synthesizers are made. Okay? I sample a voice, I can sample a sine wave, I get a beautiful sound, and I can synthesize that going through this process. Okay? So I figure out what are the co various Fourier coefficients, and when I reconstruct them, add them up, all these sine waves, I'll be able to produce that sound. So, the magnitude of these coefficients represents the magnitude of this higher harmonics. How important are the higher harmonics in each one of these instruments? That gives it a distinct quality. Same thing with voice as well. Okay? This is exactly what we are doing when we are saying that I'm going to take a basis function and I'm going to find what are the best values of that coefficient AI such that when I expand the series and add it up, I get the original function, the original waveform, as closely as possible. So my job is essentially a curve fitting job now. Okay? So we're going to do curve fitting uh, in MATLAB pretty soon, but I want you to get across the concept of what is a basis function. It is a set of known functions, just like basis vectors or a set of known unit vectors. In fact, basis functions will, will also have that uh, normalized magnitude of that will be unity. Okay? So we just take these basis sine, for example, is a well-defined function. It goes between minus and plus one. Okay. So we take such functions, and uh, there are many, many such functions in Mac, and we can use any one of them depending on the what is appropriate for the particular case, and do a functional approximation like that. Okay. So one way of doing it is through a series expansion, Taylor series. Another way is to c come up with a set of basis functions, known basis functions and then write them as a linear combination of those basis functions and make it equal as, as much as possible. It will now be exactly equal. If it is exactly equal, that means you have an exact representation of the function. Okay? And in fact, that is what we do when we are solving a differential equation. Uh, Bessel function is an exact representation of solution to that particular differential equation. A Bessel function is an infinite series. Okay? So if you want to truncate it, then we need to approximate it. So it will always be an approximation. Any questions on those concepts? So you learned a lot. You learned about Fourier series, you learned about music a bit. <laughs> okay. But the basic thing is the idea of a basis function. So <clears throat> let's choose. What, what, how do I choose a basis function? The simplest one I can think of is 1 x, x squared, x cubed, x to the power 4, etc. With a certain finite number of terms. Okay? So I, by, by that I mean I'm going to let my basis function, it turns out to be a very poor basis function. Sines and cosines and Legendre <coughs> functions, Bessel functions are much better behaving, but this one is not. We will see why it is when you do the numerical part. But the simplest one to think of is uh, another property of a basis function should be that they should be independent. One function should not depend on the other. Okay? So if you want to think to put that constraint, you can never express one function in terms of the other in the this, in this series. Okay? So this is a polynomial. It's going to give us a polynomial expansion of a certain degree n, depending on how many terms that we take in the series. Okay? So that is what we call uh, the basis function x to the power i minus 1. The reason I have called it as i minus 1 is because I want to label my starting point as i equal to 1. MATLAB doesn't like 0 index, right? So I'm starting it as I'm uh, 1, 2, 3, etc. So that I have a1, a2, a3 as my unknowns that, are the, that I need to find. And so this is polynomial of degree n minus 1 if I take n terms in the series. Meaning if I take, for example, 4 terms, 
I'll get a third degree polynomial with four unknown coefficients. A third degree polynomial will have four unknown coefficients. Okay. So my job then is given a function, in the, our case error function, we are trying the alternate way of constructing an approximation. Okay. So you give me the error function and say build an approximation for it over a certain range. So that has to be specified. Okay. I want to approximate the error function between 0.5 and 0.7 or 0.5 and 1, something like that. Okay. So that what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate that error function at a certain number of points. So if I choose a third degree polynomial, how many points should I evaluate that error function at? Hmm? Three? Four. Four. Why? Because the third degree polynomial will have four unknown coefficients in there. So I need four conditions. Okay. So the problem I'm trying to do graphically, if you want to understand that, is this function, error function. Okay. And I want to construct an approximation to the error function. Okay, it's already slowing down. Okay. And over a certain range. I would like it to be as close to the error function as possible, but between a certain range, I don't know which I picked later on, uh, 0.5 and 1, I believe. 0.1 and 0.5. Let's pick that. Okay. 0.1 and 0.5. In that range, I want to construct a blue curve which is as close to the error function as possible. And I want this to be a cubic polynomial. The blue curve to be a cubic polynomial, but it must pass through those four points that I'm going to compute. Okay? So, these points where I evaluate these functions are called the collocation points. Okay? Uh, I guess I don't have the term here. But these are the points where I want to evaluate between the two limits. The limit is A and B. So I take the limit A from A to B and we decide I want four points. I divide them equally so that I get four points in that interval. And this formula will give you that. So we have to be able to program these in MATLAB. Okay? And then I, I want, this is the key concept here, I want the error at these points to be those points. Okay? And only at those four points. Intermediate places, they will be different because the functions are not the same. The blue curve is only an approximation to it. So I impose the condition that when I evaluate that function, which in this case is the error function, at those points xk, I want that to be the difference between that and the functional approximation that I'm constructing to be equal to zero. I'm now going through the process of how does curve fitting work. Okay. So I have four values of the function that I want to approximate and I've selected four points and I want to make the error between the function and its approximation zero, exactly zero at those four points. Why do I have to do that? Because I have four unknowns, the coefficients a1, a2, a3, a4. I need to find them in the best way possible. Okay. So I am imposing the condition that at these points, I want the error to be zero. That gives me a system of linear equations. Okay, so here. What does that condition imp imp impose? It simply is. Now, let me just pause and ask because there are a lot of light cases and say, are you guys following? Yes? If you're following this, I guess I have put the notes, but probably I put it so late that you don't have it. So I have an exercise for you if you follow. So this is the error at those collocation points. In our case, there are four points. And I want the error to be equal to zero. That gives me this equation. This is a system of linear equations. Okay. What are the unknowns in this equation? See, you're not following. <laughs> I can tell. A values. Okay. So in this equation, the unknowns are a1, a2, a3, a4. What are these? Xk to the power i minus 1. Those are all just numbers. Okay. Numbers coming from the basis. These are basis functions evaluated at xk. xk are the collocation points that are given by this formula. So if I say at this stage, go and program this and get me the four coefficients, we should be able to do that. 
So if you understand everything that has happened here, the only unknown in that equation is AI and you need to formulate that and on the right hand side, what is this? This is just the error function evaluated, the exact value of the error function evaluated at those four points. Okay, And these are the basis functions evaluated at those four points. So how many equations do I have? Four. Okay, If I am talking about the cubic polynomial n is equal to uh, uh, four, I have uh, uh, four by four equations in there. Okay, there are four unknowns and four by four equations. Take a minute and write it as a matrix problem for me. I want to make sure that you guys really understand it. Okay, That can be cast as P times A equal to F. P is going to be a matrix. A is going to be a vector. Okay, And F is going to be a vector of numbers. So P matrix will contain only numbers, but you need to know what number goes where. It's going to be a 4 by... So keep uh, M equal to 4, so you're dealing with third degree polynomial. This uh, think pair share is not working well, isn't it? Some of you are doing, but others are just okay. <laughs> Let's see what he does next. How many of you know how to do that? How many of you don't know how to do that? Let me have. Given this, how to construct it as a matrix. Okay. Then we need to work that out. But do you understand up to this step what we have done so far? We talked a lot about concept, but now we are developing that into an algorithm. Okay. And only then you will be able to again, like ISIS, there is a MATLAB tool which you can use blindly without knowing any of these. But you need to understand the theory behind it, how MATLAB does. That's what this course is about. Okay. So any questions on how you get this? What would the size of P? P would be a 4 by 4 matrix. P would be a 4 by 4 matrix because we are dealing, this is a very general expression for any N. But I am saying for our purposes, let's fix N equal to 4. When I fix n equal to 4, my basis functions are 1, x, x squared, x cubed. That is my basis function. Okay? And uh, I'm evaluating them at points called x1, x2, x3, x4. Okay? So the points are x1, x2, x3, x4. So I have four unknowns. The unknown vector A is A1, A2, A3, A4. My question is, fill in the right and left hand side, the left hand side P and the right hand side F. That's given in this equation. So you need to understand that equation. Okay? And then we will do it in MATLAB. You will see how it is done. So you understand that, so we can proceed to the next step, how to put the right hand side and the left hand side together. Okay, It's, it's simple, if I, somebody gives you a formula like this, you need to of course understand what it does. So this says that AI times x is upon i minus 1 summation, which we will expand the summation. Right hand side is upon xk, but k goes from 1 to n. So this is where we are telling, for each value of k, you are going to get one equation like that. k equal to 1 will give you the first equation. K equal to 2 will give you the second equation. So if n is 4, you will get 4 such equations. So write out those 4 equations and then see whether you can put it in matrix form. Okay. So if I write down, let me write down the first equation. Um, K equal to 1, the first equation will, will be, and I'm going to expand the left hand side. Okay. So it's going to be A1, it will be X1 to the power what? No, zero. Because i is one. So I'm expanding the left hand side and putting k equal to one. 
So I'm getting when k equal to 1 means I'm writing the first equation. Then i equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. I'll get four terms on the left hand side. So when i equal to 1, it's x to the power of 0, which will actually be 1. Okay? Plus a2 times x1 to the power 1 plus a3 x1 to the power 2 plus a4 x1 to the power 3 equals on the right hand side what will it be? f evaluated at x1 that is the error function evaluated at x1 so that's going to be f1 and that is a known number you need to know the error function values at four locations to construct this approximation okay now do you understand how the expansion goes you should be able to write that for k equal to 2, 3, and 4. Then, what would be the vector f? Are you guys? f vector will simply be f1, f2, f3, f4. Four numbers or the error function values evaluated at those four locations. x1, x2, x3, x4. What will the matrix P look like? I have it here. You can look at that. The first term is always 1. Why is it 1? It's always x to the power 0. x1 to the power 0, x2 to the power 0. So as you are going down here, we are putting k equal to 1 in the first case, equal to 2 in the second case, 3 in the third case, etc. Going down like that. Okay. So this illustration is actually for fourth degree polynomial, five unknowns. Okay. And then you have x which is this term multiplied by a2 okay and then x square which is this term x1 square which is multiplied by a3 so now you should be able to take this matrix c multiplied by the vector x and then equate it you will get the four equations that you need okay the four equations that you need. now is that clear any questions on that how many of you still have doubts on how to do this? Yes. Okay. Um, you said we didn't have that value, I get that, but we actually have to like, plug in the labs and values and figure them out? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you need to evaluate those. If it is the problem of constructing error function approximation, you need to figure out what those are. Okay. But if it is a waveform that comes from a digital sampling, then you know the data points. Right? Do the error function of Okay, so what you see then, I'm, I have laid out the algorithm. Now I'm trying to evaluate <coughs> all the terms that I need. I need to evaluate P, I need to evaluate F. So here what I'm saying is these are my collocation points. These are the points where I want to evaluate the function. So this example is actually for a fourth degree polynomial. So there are five points at point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4, point 0.5, okay? And then these are the error function values at those locations. Maybe let's go and do this in MATLAB and yeah, see. Okay, so this function, just for illustrative purposes, um, evaluates an approximation to the error function of any degree that you specify. So n is an input parameter, and I specify I want the third degree, it will automatically construct a 3 by 3, uh, a 4 by 4 problem, invert it, give me the coefficients of the polynomial. Okay, so I want to take, uh, I want you to take a while to see whether you understand every step, and if you have any questions, um, Ask me, and then we'll discuss that. You have seen what we need to do. Now, this is the MATLAB implementation of that idea where I want to find the unknown coefficients a in the polynomial representation to the error function. And I've used all the programming techniques that I've learned so far to implement this particular idea of doing a curve fitting. Okay? Using the basis function as 1x, x squared, x cubed, etc. So, what am I doing in line for 6? That's the first significant line, setting the lower and upper bound. So I want an approximation between point 0.1 and point 
Okay? Then in act eight, what am I doing? I'm calculating my points. So what is x1, what is x2, x3? So if I pass n equal to eight, that means I need, uh, I'm constructing a seventh degree polynomial. I need eight data points. So this will automatically create the eight data points for me. How does it do that? Starts at a, and then it divides the interval b minus a into n minus one intervals. Okay, so that I get n points exactly. N minus one intervals will, like if I have three points, I have two intervals. If I have four points, I have three intervals. Okay, so I have n points. That means I need to divide that into n minus one intervals. And then what am I doing in line ten? Calculating the error function, the function that I want to fit. Okay. And then I'm constructing the matrix in lines 11, 12, and 13. Okay. And, and the next significant one is 18, where I'm inverting P backslash F. So in numerical analysis, you will find that every problem that we solve eventually reduces to solving a system of linear equations, whether it is curve fitting, solving nonlinear, like in Newton method. You are constructing your Jacobian matrix and you invert that to solve a linear problem. Okay? So that's that's why linear problem, linear algebra is so important in computational methods. Um, yeah. Question? The of the P function is just all space or all space. Say, say it again. The colon is the P function, uh, line 13. Yeah, the colon in uh, here is, it refers to the second index, which is all uh, columns in a row, yeah. right. So what I'm doing here is I'm constructing one equation at a time, one row at a time. When k equal to 1, I'm constructing the first row of p. Okay. And then it's doing all the columns. It's doing all the columns in the first row. Okay. Yeah. That is important. Um, how does it know how many columns? How does it, huh? Oh, hold on, let me ask. How, how does it know how many columns are there? N. So it's going to be the same number of uh, columns as rows. Right? Square matrix. Yeah, it is a square matrix. It should be a square matrix. We will see how to extend this idea for least squares problem, and you have more data than the uh, functional form that you want to fit. But this is you will generate as many points as the degree of the polynomial. Then you'll always get a square matrix P. What was your question? Yeah. Well, 0 to n minus 1, what will that produce? You can go to MATLAB and try that, right? It's going to produce a vector starting with 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n minus 1. Please, yeah, I cannot hear. Go back to where? Notes? Yeah. Yeah. What's that defined somewhere is that? Here, b minus a, uh, k minus 1 divided by n minus 1. Now, this one, this formula creates one coordinate at a time. When k equal to 1, it will create x1, k equal to 2, it creates x2. But in MATLAB, you can implement the same idea as a vector. Okay? So, I'm making this as a vector, 0 to k minus 1. Okay? So, uh, the, the only way to learn MATLAB is try to understand and dissect every section. Whenever I put a piece of code, you should be able to understand why everything is there the way it is. See if you can improve it. Okay? Uh, if you don't understand it, don't accept it as a blind code and then try to run it. Okay? Because you're learning MATLAB. Because when you're doing a process engineering, you probably don't care because you can get away by using just ISIS. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you need a then, like as your first term, then a as each of the next terms? Right. Is, why does it make just the first term a? Did you just have a plus? Right. Very good. Very good. Let's let's dissect that. Okay. This is what I wanted. I want you to dissect and understand. I, what I want to do at this stage is I want to produce a vector containing all the points where I want to evaluate the function. Okay. It's a vector. Now, uh, uh, that vector should start at A and end at B. The elements in that should start at A, end at B, and should have equally spaced data points between those. Those are the criteria that I need to meet in that particular line. So, now think of this as a MATLAB robot that's going and analyzing. This is exactly what MATLAB does. 
it parses, meaning it reads a symbol x. Okay, it knows I'm going to assign a variable okay, equal to. So x is going to be assigned a certain value, and then it parses a. A is a scalar, right? So it keeps the scalar, and then it says, okay, I'm going to come see what is what operation I need to do on a. So it's add plus. And then I, I have a bracket here. So it's trying to figure that out. Okay. What does this mean? It says generate a vector going from 0 to n minus 1. So that alone will produce the vector 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. up to n minus 1. So the length of that vector will be what? n. Okay. So 0 to n minus 1, the length of that vector will be n. That vector then gets multiplied by b minus a over n minus 1. What is b over b minus a? Is that the difference, the range. And that range has to be divided into n minus 1 intervals. So this is your delta spacing between the points. So this vector is multiplied by the spacing. When you do that multiplication, what are you going to get? What would be the result of that uh, expression? You have 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. Now you will have 0. So let's call this as delta x, the increment between two points. Okay? So in this case, what would be the increment? This is 0.5, this is 0.1, so the difference will be 0.4, divided by, let's say, n equal to 4, right? 0.4 divided by 3, whatever that number happens to be. That would be your delta x. So this will multiply by that number, right? So instead of 0, 1, you will have 0, delta x, 2, delta x, 3, delta x, 4, delta x, etc. So that you are adding a scalar number. So what does that do? It adds that a to all the vectors. And that should produce what you want. Very good point. So uh, after I execute the last line, my left boundary is gone from MATLAB's memory. Right? But it is this a that is returned. It's a poor choice. That's a very good observation. It's a poor choice of variables. Because I'm using the same variable in two positions, but it doesn't introduce an error. Normally, it will introduce an error when you start doing that, but here I'm exiting. Luckily, it is in the last place. Okay? So, any questions? Did you, did you have a question? Or? Uh, yeah, yes. Um, the, you don't need a period before the multiplication sign of the 0 to n minus 1. Mm -hmm. You don't need a period there. It's not going to be a. No, that's a good question, too. Um, remember, the operation of the scalar with the vector. It means the scalar is added to every term in the vector. Okay, so those are the things that uh, you can try in MATLAB window. For example, if I create um, y is equal to zero four, okay, and then I add point five plus y, it adds that to every element there. Okay. That, that's the best way to dissect it. Take that line. If you don't understand it, okay. Take the inner part and type it out and see what happens. Then build around it, okay? Uh, okay, so we have looked at what the function does. Let's just execute it. Um, e or f or x uh, 4. And let me store it in a variable called a4. All right. So, what did it do? Well, it printed out the determinant of that matrix C and it printed out the four coefficients of the polynomial approximation to the error function. Okay? So, I'm going to now, um, I guess, I explicitly create this 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.4 divided by 3, 0 0.5. Four data points that were equally spaced that was created within that I created outside. Why did it do that? Because I want to plot it. So these are the error functions. Okay. So I'm going to try to. Oh, I need to evaluate the polynomial. I need to evaluate the polynomial coefficients represented like this. How do they do that? Uh, there is a function called polyval. What it does is it takes the polynomial coefficients and evaluates the polynomial at any number of positions that you want. Okay? 
So here it is, the explanation for the poly valve. There is another function called poly fit, which does everything that we have done so far. Okay. Um, so the way that you would use that poly valve is give it two arguments. The first argument is the coefficients of the polynomial. The second argument is the place where you want to evaluate that polynomial. Okay. So I'm going to create a variable called z. It's going to go from 0 0.01 to 0.5. And then I'm going to call it as tz polyval a4 divided by z. What am I trying to do? I first I fitted the polynomial, the, the error function to a third degree polynomial. The coefficients that came, I stored it in a vector called a4. Okay, so I'm passing that a4 and telling polynomial evaluate this polynomial for me using those coefficients at a range of z values. Okay, so I have now two sets of data I want to plot. One is z, p z. The other one is x, comma y. But I'm going to plot this as symbol. What do you expect that I should get? An error. If I don't put the comma there, <laughs> still an error. <laughs> Vectors must be the same length. Um, pardon me. PZ should have the same length as Z. See, PZ is the polynomial, fourth degree polynomial that is evaluated using the coefficients on the fourth degree polynomial at these Z locations. So I selected 40 locations between point 0.1 and point 0.5. That's what I do here. Then I pass that and evaluate the polynomial on those locations. This is the polynomial approximation to the other function. And we can see that both are polynomial. Five values back. What values? Uh, five values of. No. Yeah, x should have four values and f should have four values. Oh, it, they should have same length, but it's not y, it is f. I stored the error function in f. Ooh, that's a very poor fit. <laughs> So this is the polynomial, and those are the four data points. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to plot to see how well the polynomial that I have evaluated fits with the data point that I have. Okay. Now, one of the I told you that the basis functions one x x squared etc is a very poor choice. Okay. So this could be because of that. But let me try to evaluate and show what happens to the determinant as I increase the degree of the polynomial. Okay, so I'm going to go back and fit a sixth degree polynomial. Okay, so look what happens to the determinant. 10 to the minus 12. Okay, it gives me six coefficients, but there is a lot of error in those coefficients. If I do an eighth degree polynomial, the determinant is. 10 to the minus 24. As I increase the number of terms in the basis function from 2 to 4 to 8, the determinant keeps going down. What does that mean when the determinant goes down from linear algebra? Uh, it's, it's, that could be one. That, that, that is, you have two equations that are not linearly independent. One equation looks very close to the other equation. Okay. The other reason that it happens is what is called poor scaling. That is, if you look at the matrix P, and I think we need to actually uh, evaluate this set of breakpoint here. And uh, oops, and run it again. So I have an eight by eight matrix now. Okay. So look at the elements in the matrix. 
Okay, we can go to actually the MATLAB window. So the matrix P becomes poorly scaled or becomes singular. Okay. What does singularity mean? Linear independence, right? The determinant going to zero. If the determinant goes to zero, you cannot invert that matrix. When you try to invert nearly singular matrices, you will get this problem of uh, poor fitting. So you can see the numbers here are one, but as you go to the right, the numbers become 10 to the minus uh, 5, 10 to the minus 6, etc. So one side of the matrix, we have large numbers, the other side we have very small numbers. And this problem gets worse and worse as you take higher degree polynomial. Okay? So we will not be able to fit a very high degree polynomial thinking we get high accuracy. We don't. That's one of the lessons that we need to learn from this exercise. I think maybe you guys are getting restless. That's a place to stop. We will pick it up from here in the next class and explore this in that way. Yeah.